welcome to the Writer's Block, the latest, greatest, biggest, and baddest episode, Grown Ups and Kids Stuff, brought to you by Sticklers, the dating service for anal retentives. <laughs> I am Rylan Grant, screenwriter, Ringo award-winning creator of comics like Aberrant, Banjax, and The Jump. The other voice in the dark, the man in the box to the right is... David Avalone, screenwriter, filmmaker, comic book writer, and... Uh guy drinking out of a too much coffee man mug that is an impressive mm. mug where does one get a mug like that uh from shannon wheeler at a convention. uh nice. i don't know what you do when there are no conventions i'm sure if you go to too much coffeeman.com while we're doing commercials for, for people who aren't on the show nice. uh you could probably find it but uh yes shannon wheeler ladies and gentlemen a terrific cartoonist nicely done um so uh hell of a show today um, why don't you uh, tee us up here? We'll go ahead and bring our guests on. Well, uh, our guests today are, let's bring them on, Troy Little and Brenda Little. Hi. Hey there. And Richard Fairgray. Hey. All of whom currently are in Canada. Is that correct? Richard, are you mm -hmm. still in Canada? I am for another week and a half. Nice. Mm -hmm. Wow. wow. The, the, the Canadian invasion. Where are you <laughs> headed to after? I am being uh, shipped back to New Zealand while my immigration is sorted out. I, uh, I, I'm just being kicked out of country after country. Oh. <laughs> it's actually nice. Like the, you, you two were like the last people I saw before I left New Zealand last time. And oh. so now you'll be the, the, the last people I see before I leave Canada this time. Oh, it's, so it, there's it, something about us. Yeah, it ends with I'm us. I'm sorry. It always ends with us. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next time you see us, they'll ship you out again. <laughs> well, guys, so, uh, why don't you introduce yourselves? Richard, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm Richard Fairgray. Um, it's very easy to look me up because I'm the only Richard Fairgray in the entire world. Uh, I am a uh, writer and illustrator of children's books and comics, uh, mostly middle grade horror series. Uh, I do a book called Black Sand Beach. Um, which the first volume is out and is coming out as an ebook if you're a stay at home isolation type like me. Um, I'm doing a, uh, I do a series called Blastosaurus about a crime fighting Triceratops. And um, I mean, I guess that's really it right now. And Brenda and Troy. Yeah, I'm Brenda Hickey. I know you introduced me as Brenda Little, but. Oh, sorry. I'm more known. For my publishing. You're not wrong. I've got two names because I like to be confusing. <laughs> but Brenda yeah, Hickey, yeah. known for Halls of the Turnip Moon. I created that one. I wrote it later and we all published it together with our imprint Pegamoose Press early this year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm best known for my work on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic with IDW Publishing. And I've recently been on a Gretzko with, um, uh, with Oni, Oni Press. Very nice. And this is truth. <laughs> so you seem to be indicating that uh, this my new book, Ingore Napkin, mm -hmm. is, is something you actually have in your possession. Yes. So that's very cool. I'm glad to see it made it all the way down there, despite, uh, you know, various viruses, flames, and everything burning. So mm -hmm. that's good. Yes. So that's cool. Um, I'm Troy Little. I worked on uh, Writer Artist for Powerpuff Girl Comics. Um, Rick and Morty versus Dungeons and Dragons. I've been doing that for a couple of volumes now with Jim Zub. Um, I did an adaptation of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas a number of years ago. And uh, I work with uh, this guy, Kevin Eastman, and, and David. David. Who? Something. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this, this year one up there, right? Yeah. The I thought it looked familiar. Rearranged Ron and Ragdolls, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, I was the artist on that. So, uh, you know, I know this guy a little bit anyway. Very nice. We never actually met in person. It's always been in a two dimensional world. So. Mm -hmm. And I think we've spoken on the phone, but this is our very first video call. Is it our first? I think, I think so. Okay. I think so. Okay. Eastman is not big on the video calls. The, the, oh. the, the plague has made him more open to the video call. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but in general, he's a phone guy. Mm. We, we Gen X slash boomers are phone guys. You know, so we, you know, we create all this Dick Tracy, you know, video phone stuff. So... <laughs> We're not yeah. used to it. I mean, we were talking before the um, the episode started, uh, backstage, as it were, about how common that is in this business. You know, with these these working relationships. I mean, I have a uh, I have artists, um, letterers, colorists that I've worked you know with for years, and I actually consider them sort of close friends. I feel very invested in their lives, but 
I um, most of them don't speak English. You know, I mean, I have I have a uh, um, artists in Mexico, uh, several in Brazil, Hungary. Um, my go-to colorist is in Indonesia. Uh, my letter is in the UK, uh, which, you know, uh, is a little bit different, but with most of these guys, they don't even speak English. So we communicate almost exclusively via email. You know, they plug it into Google translate. They get about 90%, 95% of what I'm saying. The final 5% can be a little bit <laughs> uh, rough sometimes. Um, you know, pay them almost, ex you know, exclusively via PayPal and all of that stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it is an interesting business. And, um, you know, I think, you know, basically in the last five years or so, this has become, it's kind of blown up. I mean, it always existed to a certain degree, but, um, this is very much the normal in the comics business, right? You work with somebody for years and, and, and you feel close to them and you've never actually met them. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. even yeah. even Mitch. even with Americans, one of my biggest collaborators is in is David Acosta, who's in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, and we've still mm -hmm. never met. We've done probably 30, 40 comic books together, and mm -hmm. have never been in the same room. Well, how much do you think it's to do with uh, writers keeping weird hours, though? Because I, I I love working with people in other countries because they're going to be awake. Like artists tend to have like far more normal daytime working hours. I think than writers, and so if you're writing at four a.m., you can be like, "Oh yeah, now it's middle of the day there. My artist is going to be up." <laughs> <laughs> that, that that goes both ways, though, right? Because um, uh, yeah, you, you have that scenario. But for me, um, I mean, I I have a day job. My day job is you're writing, you know, movies and TV shows, um, and getting time to write is is often hard to kind of. Orchestrate, right, like, right? That, that doesn't count as a day job, right? That, that's not, when people say they <laughs> have a day job, they mean like. Yeah, <laughs> it it, uh, it it very much is a uh, a slog of a day job sometimes, but it, but I understand sometimes I sound like an asshole saying that, uh, uh, complaining that I get to write uh, uh, movies for a living. But um, but 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 the point I was getting at was, um, you know, it's uh, sometimes I think, oh wow, tomorrow I'm going to bed, right? And I'm like, tomorrow um, I have the whole day. You know, the it, first time in a month, I have an entire day to write. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to knock that pilot out. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be the greatest day that, you know, I've, I've had in, in, in a year. Um, and then I go to sleep. But while I'm asleep, my letter is cranking away. My, my, art, my artist, <laughs> you know, my colorist in Indonesia is cranked away. And I wake up um, and my inbox is full. And I have like an entire issue from the letter to proof. I have uh, 12 pages from the colorist to proof. I have layouts from this artist and layouts from that artist and then my entire day shot and I don't have my writing day. So um, yeah, I get sneak attacked with the time. Like I, I don't appreciate it at all. The time difference kills me. <laughs> it works for us because in a deadline, you know, like a Friday deadline and we like, mm -hmm. oh, we got four hours on California. Like yeah, right. on one extreme <laughs> coast to the other. It's yeah, like, oh, okay. it's a bonus time for those little last minutes. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Where does I I can't remember where Jim Zub lives. Um, he's in Toronto, right? Oh, okay. Toronto, so. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've only I ever run into him at a, no, at a con or two. Not. <laughs> but yeah, even Our misinformation. Even just in the even just with the Americans again, like by the time I wake up, Dave Acosta's been drawing for three hours mm -hmm. at least. Also, he has like you he has kids, so he's getting up just like Ryland, he's getting up way before I would be getting up even if we lived in the same city yeah. with one another. Um, I have, you know, cats jumping on me, but they can they can wait <laughs> uh, in a way that living humans uh, probably shouldn't wait. But yeah, I will usually wake up to at least a couple of texts asking me questions uh, and, you know, hopefully no one waits too long. But yeah, that whole thing of like, oh, I have all day tomorrow, and then you open up and you've got a lot of project management stuff to do. Mm -hmm. um, I was but... um, I, I worked with a, an artist for about six years in Chile, and um, we never met in person. It was all everything was just email. I'd never even seen a picture of him, and then we were going to be at the same convention, and the day before the convention, I was downtown having a, a little bit of day drinking, and I look across the street, and there's this guy, and I say that guy looks like a character from my comics. That's weird. And I just took a shot. I was like, hey, Gonzalo. And he was like, oh, yes. And he like, recognized me from the internet. It was so weird. But like, I was like, yeah, that's right. That's what, that's what we do. We all draw ourselves into every book. Yeah, that, 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 that's really funny. My, my, my latest one, uh, The Jump, um, the, the protagonist is, I mean, he is just, he's the artist, Fabio Elvis. He just drew himself. And the funniest thing is, I mean, you can see, you see those abs? 
<laughs> like Fabio, Fabio does not have those abs, right? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, he's, right, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it works with the book, the whole idea. It's a, it's an astral projection book. So the whole idea is that the guy's kind of this like chubby schlub in real life. And then, you know, you see your ideal self in the astral world. So to his credit, he made himself a, a, a chubby schlub in the, in the real world. But, but <laughs> man, he, he, he really let loose <laughs> with, with the muscles. And, uh, and, and I, I have not, uh, I have not let him hear the end of it. So I do I, know that is a fun, that is a funny genre that I've noticed of artists who are, conventionally attractive people who are using themselves as models clearly over and over and over again, where you go, oh yeah, she's always drawing Joelle Jones. That's pretty much just Joelle Jones in her comics, looking very much like her, who is a very beautiful woman. So <laughs> when she needs to draw a very, very beautiful woman, she just holds you know, pulls up a mirror and goes, hey, there's one right now. That must be nice to have that certainty. Like, oh, yeah. this repulsed yeah. someone really good looking. I got that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we were we were going to talk about with you guys in particular. Um, you all have done children's stuff and adult stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, walking the line between those two genres and you know, what's different and what's the same and how nervous do you make your publishers when you're working on a kid's book, but you also have Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas on the shelves. <laughs> well, 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 yeah, because let's just be straightforward. I'm actually banned uh, in seven states from doing children's stuff. So, um, <laughs> you know, my, 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 my previous work has, uh, you know, has ensured that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'd be getting that call anytime soon. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd like to hear about walking that line. Yeah, I don't know. Like I started out when I uh, when I started working with uh, IDW, I was publishing. They were they were publishing my Angor Napkin books um, and Kiriskira, some of my early self published books. And uh, one day, I just got a, I worked a lot of years in animation. I got kind of tired working in animation. I wanted to do comics, more of a full time gig. So I'd asked them, having a little bit of a relationship with them, you know, what did they have? That maybe I could do, and they had just gotten the uh, Cartoon Network license. Mm. First thing they were going to launch with was Powerpuff Girls, which I was a big fan of. So I knew this show really well. I was a big fan of it, and uh, I was like, "Oh, can I write it? Can I draw it? Can I color it? Can I do everything?" You know, just that indie mentality of just give it to me, let me do it all. <laughs> and uh, they're like, "You've never worked in monthlies before. It's going to eat you alive." And I found out pretty quick that that was the case. <laughs> um, but they did give me a, a good chunk of, I did like uh, six, like eight issues of Powerpuff Girls, I think, um, before our son was born. And then uh, I was just handing- were you, were you writing those and coloring them and drawing them, or were you just drawing them? Some of them. Some of them I, yeah, I, you didn't I, get to color all of them, but yeah. you wrote all of them. Yeah, I colored about three issues. I, I lettered as much as I, they'd let me, and, you know, I'd do everything as much as I could. Just that control freak nature in me, you know, Dave. <laughs> um, so one day I'm just handing in my pages and I get an email from IDW saying, you know, like, you know, business as usual, everything's looking good. Would you be interested in pitching for Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? And I'm like, Interesting. it was way out of the blue. And I'm like, why would you think to get the guy who draws Powerpuff Girls to do, you know, the drug novel of the seventies, you know, adaptation, which is one of my favorite books. So I'm like, well, for whatever reason, you know, you sent this to me. Yeah, I wanted, I want to pitch for it, and and then I proceeded to not pitch for it for a long time because it's one of my favorite books, and I just know I'm going to do it a huge disservice by putting my fingerprints on it. I can only make it worse, is what I was thinking. But I love it so much that if somebody's going to do it, it might as well be me because at least I care about it. If I screw it up, at least my heart's in the right place. And. Uh, I eventually was forced to put in a pitch because I was avoiding it and avoiding it. And two days later, they said, you're off Powerpuff Girls. This is what you're doing for the next year and a half is adapting Fear and Loathing Las Vegas. So it was a huge switch from what I was doing to what I went to do. So I love both things. Like, I love Powerpuff Girls. I love Fear and Loathing. So it's like, okay, cool. Like, I, I have to give up one cool project for another cool project. Okay. Um, That's wild. So I did not realize that I always I assumed you came to them with with fear and loathing. I had no idea that was something that was a license that was a license that IDW just randomly picked up. 
Uh, Ted Adams was a huge, huge fan of Hunter's work, and it was like his yeah. dream project to make that happen. So I found out much, much later at one of the San Diego Comic Cons, um, they had they had sent this to like everyone. Everybody had had a shot at this book. Um, like I couldn't believe that it hadn't been been signed up by somebody. Like so, what happened? I guess is that they had a real idea or a vision of what this should look like, and if it wasn't going to look like that, we're not going to do it. Mm. And everything that they were getting back was not quite hitting the mark, you know. And I'm thinking, oh my God, Jim Mafood should do this, and thought all these different people should. Have. They're like, oh, we pitched Jim Mafood; he wouldn't do it. Yeah, he um, didn't even respond. Did he say? No, he said, nope, not touching it. It's my yeah, favorite he, book. I'll yeah. screw it up. Like same as me, except he didn't bite, you know. Yeah. Um. So anyway, uh, tons of people had pitched for it, and I guess for whatever reason, um, IDW wasn't feeling it from from the samples they were getting. And they were about to just kind of let the the uh, the option they had on it lapse, when somebody kind of like at a, at a meeting said, you know, any any ideas? And somebody's like, what about Troy Little? Um, like, huh? Well, yeah, because I've seen some of my other work, and it's it's kind of cartoony. And they're like, maybe that could work, you know? Do you think they were kind of looking at it and thinking like? You know, the way Troy writes uh, the relationship between Professor Utonium and Mojo Jojo is <laughs> Gonzo and Raul. I, I, uh, by the way, that silence that I had before was me trying desperately to pull all my references together to make that joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good pairing, though, yeah. I think it's wild that I had no idea. I hired, It's and here's the funniest part of that chain. Me and Kevin Eastman hired you to do the ragdolls on the strength of fear and loathing in Las Vegas, not having a single clue that you had done the Powerpuff Girls, which is very close to the ragdolls. <laughs> yeah. You know, we had no idea you wow. had done something exactly like the ragdoll. And I will admit, I didn't think about the Powerpuff Girls when we were developing it. But uh, once it was done, everyone was like, well, it's three girls. It's got the Japanese influence. I'm like, yeah, there's, that's definitely it. <laughs> I will say that, and this is a complete aside, but I'm not often jealous of someone else's writing. There's a Powerpuff Girls gag that is, I am so angry that I didn't come up with that joke first. There's an episode where they're fighting some evil super genius, and he, like Blofeld, he has the little white cat. And they defeat him, they adopt the cat, bring it home, and the cat takes over their professor and turns him evil. And the idea that in the James Bond movies, it's the cat running Spectre. Blofeld is just an empty suit being controlled <laughs> by the cat. That is a genius. And especially because if you know the series, for a lot of external reasons, Blofeld kept getting replaced by different actors. So it's always a different guy playing the head of Spectre, but it's the same white cat. So just whatever writer went, what if it's the cat running Spectre and the guy the, the guy in the Nehru jacket is just a cutout, is totally unnecessary. He's just there to do the speaking for the cat. I'm totally mm -hmm. jealous of that idea. It's such a great one. This was a really smart show because it, it yeah. read demographic. It was, it was cool for girls. It was action and, and kick-ass for boys. It was funny for adults. Like It hit every mark and, and everyone. I don't know anyone who doesn't like the Powerpuff Girls, and that's why it was yeah. so great. No, it's a terrific show. Yeah. Richard, how about you? How do you balance the the two? Uh, I flip wildly between them, and then every time I do one of them for too long, I almost snap. Uh, I had to give myself a real pep talk before coming on here tonight and be like, "You need to not, you need to not go fully adult for this conversation." Is the <laughs> chorus like? You can have your drink, but you need to remember that like you have a kids' book coming out <laughs> regularly. And that your adult content, where you where you make some bad life choices in a memoir, maybe isn't the thing to talk about all the time. But it's really <laughs> more fun. So, for instance, the other day, um, I was I had to go. I, I've been I've been in total isolation now for 195 days, and um, uh, with, with one brief uh, flight because of deportation. Um, and I was I, I had to go get an eye test. And my husband was in getting his one first, so I had a full hour. Why am I, why am I telling the story? I'm sorry. Um, he's in there for a full hour, and I'm sitting in the car, and I need to go to the bathroom. And I can't because I can't bring myself to go into the McDonald's because I'm terrified of everything at this point. 
Sure. Um, so long story short, I'm pooping in the back of my van. And, <laughs> and the thing is, it, it, I had a garbage bag. We had some old clothes that we were throwing away. It, it all worked out. I put it in the trash. Everything was fine. When I got my eye test done, the optometrist came close to me and almost touched me, and I burst into tears. It was a good day. It was a good start to my week. But then afterwards, I had maybe four phone calls that afternoon, and every single one of them, I excitedly told them about the fact that I'd pooped in a van that morning. <laughs> Like I've spent the past several months doing nothing but like whenever I'm I'm speaking to anyone, I am publicly promoting a family friendly, albeit horror based, but family friendly comic book. I'm like, where do I get to let out the the, the, the you know, I'm a garbage person deep down. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the family friendly book is Black Sand Beach, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It is um so, and the oh, and the, the non the memoir who the, the, is this the, memoir, the same publisher or the, no, the no. yeah, I didn't uh, think so. Black Sand Beach is from Pixel and Ink Books. Um and it's an ongoing graphic novel series. Uh I like to call it a comic series, but people don't like it when I do that for some reason. Um it is a 200 page book every year about a kid spending his summer at a horrible falling down beach house and there is a haunted lighthouse and a dimension of pure darkness trying to break its way through uh and infecting the sand and making everything dark and sinister and distorting everything that's there um loosely based on my own childhood that i spent where i spent all my summers at a haunted lighthouse um and it's it's I mean really from from an adult perspective it's about a kid dealing with massive amounts of trauma but like with 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 fun goofs uh, and then my adult thing is uh, a memoir called Octopus one one of my adult things but the most recent is a memoir called Octopus um, about two years of my life where I um, went from uh, basically bridging the gap from a suicide attempt to uh, realizing things were going to be okay because I'd moved to Hollywood. Um, and it covers a lot of drinking and poor decisions and grinder adventures and uh, meeting fun dogs. Um, <laughs> and my ongoing fear that I am turning into an octopus because of the ink stains I leave everywhere um, amongst other gross imagery. And is... It, does that have a publisher? Are you self-publishing you know, that? I, 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 I've done nothing with it. It's one of these things where I've had a couple of offers and I always get scared because if I put this out, like when I was in New Zealand, I had a, a backlog of books. I, I have 230 something books to my name at this point and 11 of them are available in America or worldwide. And so I'm sort of really trying to find that balance where I'm like, hey, when I had 200 books, I could put out anything I wanted and I had so much other stuff there that I could be like, Hey, you go to that area of the booth, you go to that area of the booth, you're different ages. You'll find different things you like now. I'm like, okay, launching a kid's book, launching two kids series in America, probably got to sit on this one for a bit. Uh, I did. It's on, like I have it all online. I, I have a sort of a separate imprint for that stuff, which is called Richard sucks. Um, and it's spelled with an X obviously because I'm awesome. And uh, that's, that's kind of where I get to put those sort of things. And David, you have one called Boy that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, that will be, I will not be promoting that through my kid friendly pages because it's about someone taking a dump and eating corn. <laughs> so it's a horror story. Don't worry. Sure. I'm starting to see themes running through all these stories. <laughs> sure. I mean, this is an interesting phenomenon, right? I mean, uh, so so you write kids' books, and there are the rules of promotion, the rules of how you live your life publicly change, right? Hmm. Um, you know, what are the new obligations, and uh, and and how do you um, how do you embrace them, or skirt them, or thumb your nose at them? I, I think that's an interesting uh, bit of food for thought. Well, you, you kind of have to just, you have to make a choice as to who you're going to want to appeal to. Like, I am I am a disabled gay immigrant. Uh, there is a large percentage of the population who are already going to be opposed to me because of that. So I have to look at it and be like, well, if I'm going to sell books to kids, 
I'm going to sell them directly to the kids and not the parents who already hate me. <laughs> and I can do that by talking a lot about poop, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> well, kids love poop. I mean, I think that's that's an undeniable uh, it's an undeniable thing. Brenda, have you ever written any adult stuff? And by adult, I mean just literally like not for children, not you know. No, like nothing, nothing too bad. I think Turnip King is as bad as I get because it's got that one little naughty bit. There's <laughs> <laughs> a, a censor bar on it. Yeah, too. it has a censor bar over her chest. <laughs> so. Very, very PG. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's totally played for gags. It's not serious at all, and it's very influenced by like all the manga I grew up with and where they'd have those kind of naughty scenes and the, a lot of teen manga would have that. So it's like, sure. well, not so bad, but it's kind of, yeah, that's as, that's as like, yeah. so, <laughs> so, so, so trust in the studio ahead. here because I'd be at one point working mm. on Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas at and this I'd, desk. And I'd be on ponies still. <laughs> so it's like, so our kids would come in and be like, you can go see what mom's doing. Like, yeah. Their mom and dad's doing <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so Brenda, uh, you always want to do kid stuff. You sort of kid stuff. I'm, I'm interested how that decision was made. And then I guess also, I mean, you, you guys have kids, mm. and so how has that influenced the work you're doing? You know, how, how did that change the way you approach things? Uh, is it, um, I mean, because I, I, I have a three year old, um, and it has certainly changed the way I look at entertainment. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I mean, I'm a guy who writes, um, you know, hard. R-rated movies, you know, kind of kick you in the face action movies. And I've never written anything else, never wanted to write anything else. However, now that my daughter is kind of coming of age and starting to sort of become a person, uh, and I spend a lot of my time just sitting on the couch, you know, particularly in quarantine times, watching, you know, uh, Ninja Turtles and now Avengers with her and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I, I watch how she kind of consumes things and how things affect her. I am, I now suddenly have this fatherly urge to create for her. Mm. Um, and so I'm, you know, I, I'm wondering how that affected you also. I think it's just what I naturally gravitate towards. I, there wasn't any big decision, like, I'm going to make a decision right now. What am I going to write? It's just, <laughs> that's just kind of what appealed to me. I just like the energy and the goofiness of kid stuff that it just feels like you're not allowed to do so. Like, I don't know, when you get to be an adult sometimes it feels like oh it has to be gritty and serious and deal with issues and sometimes it's like can i just have some fun <laughs> i just want some fun mm -hmm. and so i think that's why i i kind of gravitate towards that and ya like teen stuff still kind of has that energy but you can get into a bit more a bit deeper if you want so that's kind of where i stop because i just i just like that energy of, of kids entertainment that is just so kinetic and i love that on a page it's one of my favorite things about comics is the kinetic energy of something that's static is really mm -hmm. exciting to me but it doesn't mean like like i love seeing anything in comics it's just my personal preference what i bring to the page but yeah there's lots of different things that i consume that i enjoy that or, you know, could be more gritty and could be this or that. It's, I'm kind of all over the board, but when it comes to what I create, I tend to just stick to the kid stuff. Because, yeah, I draw kind of cute, too. I don't think adults want cute in their <laughs> art style. Maybe not. So they want, I don't know. I, all of Richard's adult stuff is adorable. It's very, very <laughs> cute. It's oh, I mean, yeah. Some of it is horrifying. And the same thing with Troy. I mean, the you know, the art in... Fear and Loathing is, for want of a better word, it's attractive. I mean, it's not Stedman, you know. Uh, it, it's not that look. And I think that's probably one of the reasons it works for that. Uh, yeah, we were really big Looney Tunes fans growing yeah. up. And there's there's like that old kinetic energy and the wacky, the, the, the expressions and stuff. Yeah, like, and the antic of it. Yeah. Just, I don't know. I just like watching that stuff and seeing that stuff. And like, it's weird because the way I draw, I feel is more based on the cartoons I would have watched growing up. Whereas like the comics I read can be some of that, but they're all over the board. <laughs> I just don't, I just want to read every comic I can. If I like it, I just like it. <laughs> yeah, we spent, no a, specific we, thing. we spent a night here recently. Mm -hmm. We like cracked a bottle of wine and we just started going on like a two hour rampage of like how awesome comics are. Mm -hmm. And we're just pulling books off the shelf. I'm like, look at this, look at this, look yeah. at this. Like, and almost everything we own in here is like, it's not a Marvel or a DC comic. It's, mm -hmm. it's everything but. Mm -hmm. um, 
Sure. There's such a great variety of stuff we've got from, you know, bone to from hell and everything in between. Yeah. So that's a, I really like that as the outer, the outer limits of comics, bone well, I, I, yeah. and from hell on the other I, side. I, I, I like that as a pitch for a comic. It's kind of bone yeah. meets from hell. <laughs> I, I, I think you have a winner there. Serial <laughs> killer. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you don't write it, I'm going to. So. Well, isn't that just Clown for the Lambs, though, where you replace the cow suit with the skin of women? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it? Another much faster. What were, the, what were the influences on you, Richard, to, to work on children's stuff and to do stuff for kids? Uh, anger, mostly. Um, <laughs> I, like, I was doing the, you know, I, I, I was. I was obsessed enough with Ninja Turtles um, as a four-year-old that uh, when, we, when we had to do book reports at school, and, and this, you know, this lasted through until I was eight or nine, I would just make up books about the Ninja Turtles and be like, yeah, that's the book I read. It was about the Ninja Turtles based on the TV show. You don't know it. And I would write these long book reports explaining this plot. Um, I think I've always had this like real chip on my shoulder that there is no media created for me, and I'm, I'm pissed about it. And so as an adult, I get to be like, hey, kid Richard, you little weirdo, sitting off in the corner by yourself not talking to anyone, here's a book for you to read. You'll like this one. And I think that, you know, we all like to think of ourselves as being outsiders and, and whatever, but I think every single one of us is. And so that's kind of, it seems to have resonated pretty well. Um, but when I, I was, I was doing this book, uh, Blastosaurus, back in New Zealand. I mean, I did it in, in America as well, but it, it ran for 10 years in New Zealand. And it was, um, what I wanted it to be was fun adventures about a crime-fighting triceratops. Uh, but my co-writer, I use that term loosely at the time, was very insistent that it should be a gritty story about a cop who is a dinosaur. And I was like, well, I don't like cops, so I wanted him to work at a laundromat. Um, when I when I when I when I dumped him and moved to America, I did have him live in a laundromat because um, it's just a really good source of income, and you don't have to explain it. Like the dude just has a lot of spare change. Um, but, but, but when I uh, when I when I was I, I've been thinking about making like picture books for years, and I'd never done it. And my first celebrity crush was Morris Stendak, um, and. Then when he died, I went to a bookstore to go and buy uh, my favorite book by him, uh, Pierre, and the bookstore didn't have it. And they didn't have anything by him. And every single book they had was like, every single kid's book they had was like a Disney tie-in or any kind of licensed thing. And they were all wrapped in plastic like Laura Palmer and had like a toy with them. And I just got so mad because as a kid, going into a bookstore and touching books was the best thing. And now kids couldn't do that because everything was designed for people who don't know kids very well to walk in and buy something on their way to a birthday party. Uh, and so I went home and I wrote my first picture book. Three days later, I had it drawn and colored and was sending it off to the printer and with no plan for what we were going to do with it. And I was like, print 10,000. We're going to change the world somehow. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then we got, we, by pure chance, uh, I stumbled into a distribution office to drop off something for something else. And I was like, you guys want to distribute a children's book for me? And they're like, show it to us. I did. And then, then we had no children's books. And so it was sort of like, I, I, I practiced with Blastosaurus, but I was like, I'd been thinking about picture books since I was a kid. And so everything kind of just happened all at once. And like, I, I work on a million things at a time. Like, like while all this was happening, I was doing a project with my friend Theo where we were making a 10 page comic every week on top of our regular stuff because DC were releasing the, the, the first time they did the 52 thing. And we we're like, well, if DC can do 52 books in a year, damn it, so can we. And so we put out 52 new comics that year um, just to prove that the two of us could. And so like, I've, again, it was always just having that, that, I've forgotten the question. I lost the thread. <laughs> I started doing kids books out of anger is really the answer. And like, it's a, it's a good, I mean, I think a lot of us, we, we, we write, we create the things that we want to see in the world. I think that's, that's a general thing for anybody who has even the smallest amount of control, creative control over their work is you, you make the thing that you wish someone had made for you. 
uh, or what you wanted more of in the world or all of that. So uh, not always anger, but sometimes anger, sometimes disappointment, sometimes just give me more of that. And God knows Bugs Bunny is the biggest influence on me. You guys mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, cartoons uh, to the degree that I'm still uh, the anthology that Richard mentioned, uh, the horror anthology. I got a character design this morning from an artist uh, who's in Rome uh, named Silvia Califano. Uh, She does the Star Trek book for IDW, really talented artist. And uh, there's a witch in the story. And I told her, I want Witch Hazel from the Bugs Bunny cartoons drawn photorealistically. Mm -hmm. Like take that incredibly simple line drawing and draw that as if that was a three-dimensional woman in the real world. And she did it, and it's amazing. Nice. <laughs> and I did, a, I, did an, I did an issue of Elvira where she, uh, it was a thing where she's in the panel, and then she has exited the panel in the, you know, between the two panels, she exits. And I had, <laughs> I told Dave Acosta, I need three bobby pins hanging in the air after she's exited and he's like what is that for and i showed him the clip he's like oh yes of course i remember the bobby pins that yeah. hang in the air after the witch exit yeah, um, yeah you say i'm like witch hazel because i leave bobby pins all over the house yeah it's like that it's a great shorthand and it's a great visual language even yeah. though it's animation not comic books and um, you're exactly right too when you said like you we, we create something that we want to see in the world that we don't see. Like in Gore Napkin that you were just holding up, it's been a project I've been working on for over 22 years in my spare wow. time in various facets. But in 1997, when me and the co-creator Nick Cross came up with it, uh, we were just like kind of like, everything in TV sucks. There was no good cartoons that we enjoyed. There was no Looney Tunes, you know, anima- uh Animaniacs. Animaniacs and everything were done, you know, and, and it had its day. And we we're just like, there's nothing good on. We should make the show we want to see. That was the kind of the idea for it. And we originally created Gordon Napkin as an animated pilot, as a series. And a couple months later, the Powerpuff Girls came on Cartoon Network. And we're like, oh, three girls, like in Gordon Napkin. And a lot of the same kind of influences and humor. So my co-partner there and creator kind of was like, well, they did it and they did it better, so I'm gonna go do something else. Meanwhile, I like, but I like King Gorn Afkin. I want to keep yeah. the stories, and so I made the graphic novels. And we did make an animated pilot. It didn't get picked up, unfortunately, but um, yeah, it was just because we wanted to to make the show we wanted to watch and put all of our crazy influences. You know, it's, it was basically the idea of like three girls in a musical pop group in horrible situations. They they can't really see the dark side of because they're shown a knife. They're so happy and upbeat all the time, but you know, Fun. it's evil dead too. They're stuck in the cabin with, you know, <laughs> or they're Franz Kafka nightmare kind of thing, you know? So yeah, it was a lot of fun making those stories and I kind of found a way to kind of take it and, and turn it into comic books. So it's nice to have just finished like uh, the final Ingor napkin book after all these years and get to move on to some other projects. Mm-hmm. So, so we, this is the last one. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. It just came in the mail a couple of days ago. Yeah, that's it. I, I had a stretch goal in the Kickstarter that if we got $100,000, I'll make another book. We came about $83,000 short of that goal. So I guess nobody wanted it that enough. Just a few. <laughs> that close. <laughs> so we... Uh, so we we write what we want to see. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, the other thing... Uh, I am obsessed with the idea of writing as therapy. I mean, that, that's that's always been the, the case for me. I mean, writing for me is about, you know, getting my demons into a room and, you know, beating the shit out of them or, or letting them beat the shit out of me and just spilling it onto a page, right? Um, and so I think there's at least some of that in everybody. Um, and I'm interested in kind of exploring the, the you know, adult uh, content, uh, children's content divide in that because I. Did I freeze or did you? He froze. I mean, well, I, I can jump in on this because I've been thinking about this a lot. You, you, sure. yeah. um, the, the, the thing about like, so the, the, the book I'm writing, Black Sand Beach, 
is a, it's, it's, it's horror. And the best kind of horror is what are things that children are afraid of, right? Not just a big scary monster, but like the stuff that children really think about. Um, in the second book, uh, the, the main character, Dash, he meets these two girls who are ghosts. And it's not, they don't remember dying. And he realizes they never died. They just forgot how to be alive, specifically because they forgot how to breathe. And as a kid, that's really scary because all of us had that idea of like, what happens if we forget how breathing works? And that now that now that Rylan's disappeared, should we all talk about him, or should we ask the question of? Hey, uh, gonna be- no, keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, man, that Ryland guy, right? What's his deal? <laughs> he's unreasonably tall. I I've I've only met him sitting down. I actually I'm not sure I've met him. I think I met him. I was dressed as Hamburglar if I did, so not a great first impression. <laughs> I think I remember that night. Anyway, continue. I remember that um, night. <laughs> <laughs> the Hamburglar. Let's just call it the Hamburglar night and. It was you the know. grimace. It, it got messy. Ah, there we go. Oh, oh technology. Back. God damn um, it. Our square order is... Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling... You're, oh. oh, we're shuffling. Oh, it's just me now. I don't think it was necessary to reshuffle, but okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, fun. I'm glad, I'm glad to have been a wrecking ball in this entire conversation. <laughs> so, Richard, what were you... Get back to um, what you were saying. Well, so what's interesting is like the the, the divide between adult and, and kid stuff and the divide between um, uh, therapy and writing is that like Black Sand Beach is hands down the most clearly trauma inspired thing I've ever written. Like it's about a boy who cannot remember the thing that happened to him last summer because it was so terrible that his mind has blocked it out. Or in the story, the darkness has literally ripped it out of him before he left the beach. He's having to slowly revisit things and figure out who he used to be while facing massive demons. I mean, I'm doing this all with like hilarious goofs and fun action adventure and like four 12 year old kids running around at a spooky beach in a haunted lighthouse. But like it's from an adult perspective, it's very clearly trauma inspired and very scary. Now, I get notes all the time saying, like, I, I get nervous because I make stuff that I think is pretty terrifying in this book to the point where, like, uh, when the, the, the first the first and second volume of it I did when I was living in L.A. And I had a, I, I was in an office that is uh, kind of haunted and I was staying there overnight, every night. And there was a big problem where a lot of very crazy homeless people from Hollywood Boulevard would be like shifted at 2.30 a.m. by the cops down to Sunset Boulevard. And on the way, they would try and break into my office if they saw the light was on. So I always had to, like, hide and keep the lights off while I was working. And I'd be writing these scary stories about a haunted lighthouse in a complex that has an actual haunted lighthouse in it and, like, genuinely scaring myself. (laughs) And I would contact my editor. I'd be like, hey, is this too scary? Because, like, we have a kid being replaced by a creature that's like an upright green horse with a mouth in its stomach. And she'd be like, no, no, that's fine. But, like, you do keep having people fall on their bottoms and get hurt. Can you stop having them get stabbed in the bottom by things? And, like, it's weird that that's the line. Like, I would understand it if I was like, like, hey, let's do some jokes about how the parents aren't present in the adventure because they're all doing sex stuff. Then I'd be like, yeah, don't put that in. But when it's like I mention farts or butts or poop, which, as you know, I don't like to talk about, <laughs> it's it's like – called out and said like hey tone that down but when i'm like hey here's a story like i i have a story uh i've got i've got a a collection of short horror fiction coming out um soon and it's based on a podcast i did earlier in the year called tales from black sand beach it's a whole tie-in thing and it's scary stories set in the same place but unrelated to the main storyline and when we recorded the first episode i sent it to a friend of mine who has five kids aged 15 to 9 and He played the first episode for them. They were all lying on the floor around his phone listening to it. And he sent me an email afterwards and he said, sorry it took so long to email, had to clean up a bunch of blood. My second oldest child got so scared that she tried to run out of the room that on the way kicked the second youngest child in the face. She lost a tooth and was bleeding everywhere but wouldn't get up because she needed to know what happened in the story. (laughs) And that's fine. I'm allowed to scare people as much as I want. And the more scary I get, the more my editors say, 
do more of that. Scare them more. Make them cry more. But if I'm like, hey, this character has to go to the B room to do a big old poop. No, can't do that. Richard, you're going to cross the line there if you mention poop again. <laughs> Well, that I mean, that's a that's a that is a, a particularly American psychosis. The uh, anything violent is fine. Yeah, is the yeah. brain no, a toilet right in their house? Doesn't that? Yeah, cool? but sex and toilets, forget it. Like that's that does that's that's completely that's completely out of there. Honestly, one of the most surprising things when I moved to America, and and a lot of people outside of America won't know this if they're watching, but when I first moved there and realized that you guys don't use bathrooms at all. That really surprised me. Yeah. <laughs> Based on I what you tell it's terrible. Tell it. Yeah. <laughs> what about autobiography in your work, Brenda? Uh, I don't know. I've got a big family and I'm afraid I'll get in trouble with them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, uh, do I want to have this conversation with my parents? Like, why would you make us look like this in this comic? And why would you do that? Of course, the only comic you read by me is the one with you in it. <laughs> I didn't want you to see. So I, that's just how I feel about that. Yeah, I could get into Craig Thompson type here. Yeah, Craig Thompson, I don't know how he does what he does because I, I know he had issues with his parents over blankets, but it's like, that's that's brave. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. just kind of put your, yourself yeah, out there yeah. in a very vulnerable kind of mm. way and include almost like, you're the people who raised you by name and stuff and, yeah, and still yeah. try to yeah, find I, I definitely prefer to stick to metaphor mm. yeah yeah so it's like and i me, think of the me. things uh, that i might put in an auto bio but i'm like how can i fictionalize that and put it in a, in a fantastical way so you got, you got to just go all in like um i, I think i think it was scott mcleod who would say right like everyone you know is dead which I misinterpreted and thought he meant just write obituaries for all your friends. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's dumb. Uh, but uh, like, I always well, my my family don't read any of my books ever. Um, my my mother, in fact, got very angry because I wouldn't, I couldn't get her a free copy of my latest book. And I was like, you can just buy one. Like, you can just you can just buy it. That's easy enough. Like, I don't have copies yet. My advances have not arrived yet. You can just buy it. And she said, I don't want to spend money on it, Richard. I'm not going to read it. Because that was nice. Um, but. Oh, family. Occasionally, my family will get upset because they'll hear about something I've written. And I always respond to them, like, if you didn't want me to be a writer, you would have been nicer to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's. It, I. My wife's ex, by sheer coincidence, and it really is a coincidence. Uh, has a similar name to one of the villains in Drawing Blood. Like I literally, I didn't choose it by that. I didn't choose the name by that uh, yardstick at all. He has nothing in common with the guy. Uh, but he was like, so is his name is Don Spiro, and the character's name is Spiridon, which is an actual name, Spiridon. It is an a and I came with up with the name because I needed a third. Uh, there, there are three Lithuanian brothers, and they're based on a pair of Lithuanian brothers I know named Adolphus and Jonas. I needed a third brother, and this is the kind of, like, overthought nonsense that I do. But uh, Tito, the Yugoslavian dictator, snuck into Yugoslavia using a passport that identified him as a man named Spiridon Mekis, which is also the name of Jonas and Adolphus. So I was like, oh, there's the third Mecca's name. It's a joke about European dictators. But my <laughs> wife's ex is like, so, Spiridon, the bad guy, the murderer. I'm like, wasn't thinking about you, Don, but, you know. I, so uh, even, when you, even when you don't have the slightest intention that way, people will still see themselves. People will still say, oh, this is all about me. Yeah, um, people will read into it and project upon it that that character represents me and yeah. they see themselves in it, yeah. Yeah, I'd always do that when I was out doodling. <laughs> this is how cool of a 20-year-old I was. I'd go with my friends to the bar and we'd draw. 
Nice. And then uh, the next one come up. How do you guys describe some fun activity? Like, we hung out in Hawaii. And then the bartender would come up and she'd be like, oh, you're drawing me, are you? I'm like, I hate that. Just not you. You're drawing me. Oh, I look so good. No. Oh, how much fun you could have. Everybody wants to project. Yeah. <laughs> Even the bartenders when you're a little year old. I had a guy. I did a. Elvira was in hell in issue six or seven or eight. I can't remember. Of Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. And I had a comic skate guy. I had to run into a comic skate guy mm -hmm. in hell. And the mm -hmm. artist drew Ethan Van Skyver. Like he didn't, it was not abstract at all. <laughs> uh, we didn't name the guy though. Someone who's not Ethan Van Skyver made four videos about how I was obsessed with him and used him in a as a character in a comic book. Still don't know who the guy is. Haven't bothered to watch the videos, but the titles of these videos are literally David Avalone is obsessed with me. They come up, came up in a Google search and I kind of looked at the description. I was like, I'm obsessed with this person I've never met or heard of. Okay. Yeah. Who, I guess, who yeah. I guess is pretty proud that he looks a lot like Ethan Van Skyver. I don't know. It's just, it's I mean, look, stuff. if Gerald Jones can look in a mirror and say, damn, I'm a beautiful woman to draw, then someone gets to go, damn, I look like Ethan Van Skyver. I better get on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> but the time and energy to do that, I mean, he absolutely spent more time making those videos than I did writing that comic book. You, you, you show uh, incredible restraint not having watched them. I don't know that I would have been able to. Uh... Because it's, I mean, it's literally the thing I always try to remind myself about the Internet is that before the Internet, you wouldn't have heard any of this stuff. You wouldn't have had to hear it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You meet someone at a party. They don't like you. You don't ever have to hear their opinion of you ever. You know what I mean? Like you don't you don't seek them out. You don't. It's like that person vanishes from your sight the minute they vanish from your sight. And I think the best thing about the internet is, as a form of communication, is that you can make people disappear forever and never see them again. Like that's a that's a huge plus. Uh, so choosing what to put in your mind, uh, especially I can I have gotten it down to a science where I can read the first eight words of a review of one of my books and know that I don't want to read the rest of the review. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Like I'll read a positive review, but a lot of times I see like no, nah, this isn't going a good way. I don't need to I don't need to have this in my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's not and you know, all due respect, I know some wonderful people who are comics journalists and comics reviewers. But the quality of reviewing in general has fallen off a cliff. It feels like in the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of, I sometimes get positive reviews for my comics that I won't share because I'm like, this is so poorly written that this good review reflects badly on me. <laughs> like it was, it was written by the this, guy's cat. That, that, yeah, that, that, you, that was the you made this person who reads at a fourth grade level, very excited. It's like, I don't want anybody. <laughs> I don't want anybody to know that that's what I did in a non-children's book, by the way. Um, but it is an interesting thing. I mean, we we haven't touched on that, but uh, Troy and I work on the ra Radically Rearranged Rona Ragdolls together. And uh, we're just finishing up the next super special, 40-page special, that Troy came up with the story idea and pitched it to us. And I love the story idea. And the thing I loved about it the most is that I could not have come up with it in a million years because it's just not, I'm not tuned to children's entertainment in that way. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting when you said that. Because um, when you and Kevin, you wrote the first one, right? Um, and it was very much like a throwback homage to the Ninja Turtles as well as every other kind of origin story you can mash yeah. into it, you know? Um, and, and what I was thinking, you know, do we do an issue two, do we do in three and four or like the Ninja Turtles, it's been through so many iterations and the big iteration of Ninja Turtles that took off was a Nickelodeon cartoon. So kind of the idea of taking it into the cartoon world, making it a little mm -hmm. bit more kids in that way was, I thought a cool, a cool way to go as opposed to just kind of. You know, an issue too. No, it was, a, it was a great idea. I mean, one of the things we love about the Ragdolls is the ability to comment on the entire history of comic books from, you know, the late 80s to the present day mm. and dipping into all of the 
all of the ways in which that has been booted and rebooted and rebooted and rebooted. Um, you know, so yeah, to do, uh, I think we're called the Ragdolls Animated Adventures. Um, yeah. Just like the Batman Animated Adventures and the, you know. It was the, definitely playing more to my strengths, I think, in the second volume than the first <laughs> one was it was really challenging um, just because it was not kind of in my comfort zone. And, and uh, It's amazing work, though. I can understand why you didn't want to do it a second time. There's a bit of that in there, too. It's like, I don't know I could do that again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So. No, it was uh, inking. Kevin Eastman is not for the is not is 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 not for the faint of heart. Uh, um, yeah, much like the fear and loathing thing, I kept thinking every time I'm touching this, I'm bringing the quality down because Kevin. I want to see Kevin do this book, not me do it over his layouts. You know, like because Kevin's going to nail this. Yeah, um, it's hard to work over someone's layouts because they have a very particular way of setting up a scene, and you would wouldn't have done it that way. So yeah. you're suddenly having to figure out a layout you would have. Like that doesn't come naturally, so yeah. it's a little tricky. Definitely, definitely, mm -hmm. from an artistic point of view, it's just like yeah. you have you have some tricks in your bag that you go mm -hmm. to, and you're like, I know how to, you know, set up a page and and, and know how to make your eye follow and and all the stuff. But that's your specific kind of mm -hmm. approach to, to yeah. designing a page or designing a layout or whatever, playing to your strengths in some ways, trying to mm -hmm. make it all work. Yeah. And then somebody else, it's like, okay, I I am another individual entirely with an entire different way of looking at the world and, and comics and layout and interpreting it to a piece of paper. Yeah. And I think we can safely say that Kevin is a very unconventional artist. Yeah. I noticed, you know, one of the, I've told this story before, but the, that's, that was the, the first issue of uh, ragdolls was the first time I ever used something approaching Marvel style. Um, because I was writing it, I had outlined it, Kevin had okayed the outline and said he was going to do layouts. And when it came to writing it and I got to the first fight scene, I was like, you really want to, you really want to tell Kevin Eastman how to lay out animals doing martial arts for five pages, huh? And I called up Kevin and I said, I'm going to Stan Lee this and say ninja fight scene for five pages. Yeah. I'll add the quips later you just make it happen for five pages and at the end this person is knocked over and this person is running away get there and it'll be fine and we did that in about three sequences in the book and i was at but i noticed you know one of the many reasons i didn't write those pages is i noticed this the other when i was thinking about it that particularly the artists the cartoonists who are used to writing and drawing their own work do not stop at the average four to six panels a page. Like that's the average. As a comic book writer, you're told, do not write a page with 20 panels on it for some artists. They will hate you for the rest of their life. But then I go back and I look at Eastman. I look at Chaikin in American Flag. I look at Miller in Dark Knight Returns. Those guys are drawing 20 panels a page routinely. And some of them are little tiny TV panels and all that kind of stuff. Some of it is repetition, but it's like, yeah, when you don't have a collaborator, you can do whatever the hell you want. But I wasn't going to sit there and write a 17 panel page for Kevin to draw. Let him, let the artist make that horrible decision for themselves. You know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. That yeah, was a good call. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seemed, it seemed like a good idea to get out of his way. When he said he wanted to do the layouts on, I was like, that's amazing. And I'm very flattered that you want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but yeah, we we stayed out of we I stayed out of his way, and I think it came out it came out great. And you know, you brought something to it that we didn't want it to look exactly like the Ninja Turtles from the '80s. We wanted it to be something 1992, something influenced by the Turtles, but not of that brand completely. Yeah, so different look. But yeah, that yeah. no, worked. It worked for sure. Yeah, and I, I think it was a fun a fun switch. Like, I know most people have, I don't think it's quite done yet, even the next book, but uh, the 40-page adventures book is going to be a real fun uh, departure from what the people who've seen Drawing Blood and Ragdolls be so far. Yeah, I like, so. the, I like the sick koi fish. I don't know why I'm fixated on the sick koi fish. But he was a lot of fun favorite. to draw. Because he just yeah. looks, looks like he's on the verge of dying, <laughs> and he's this pathetic thing. So that's something to look forward to. Yeah. Is this what's his? What's his? Herbert is the Herbert. name of the koi. 
Yeah, yeah. A major character is a yeah. an, a, an an ailing uh, koi fish who. This is the saddest thing you've ever seen in your life. Very moving final speech at the end of the <laughs> of the forty pages, by the way, because you know that's yeah. that's where you want to go with that. But my point, you know, where we where we started this whole section was that uh, the story idea of that, which is that the supervillain has stolen all of the fish in New York City. There is just a part of I don't have the brain that does that as a story idea. And that's not a like that's not a knock on my talent or your talent. It's just a it's a different way of it's a child's way of perceiving the world. Uh in a way that I would go, well now how would he do that? Would he refrigerate it like and in children, that doesn't matter at all. That <laughs> man needs armor. Otherwise, he'll get hit with bullets. You know? Yeah. How did that yeah. ever survive? Yeah. Yeah. It, Hang it, on. I, I, can, can I take a guess? Like, do you, do you just go with, like, the fish are all missing? Or, I mean, it's or, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. That's the first page. <laughs> the first wonder, like, every, like, there's a story on the news about how no one can get fish these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally in a, the first scenes in a sushi restaurant, and they run out, and that's the that that's the you know motivation to action. Yeah, yeah. and then yeah. everything. Um, we're at a sushi. Cats that can't eat raw fish. This is a crisis that we have yeah. to solve. You know, and it's part of that whole you know the the food chain as it is understood in cartoons. You know, <laughs> which goes dog, cat, mouse, fish is the other fish and bird are the other branches off the under cat you know, uh, evolution chart that we use exclusively in cartoons. Uh, cats and dogs cannot be friends. Dogs and, you know, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very complicated view of uh, biology, obviously. Speaker, cats and dogs cannot be friends. <laughs> it's always I've romantic. Seen it, I've, seen it, I've seen it in my, with my own eyes in, in life, but not in in cartoons it is a, it is an unacceptable it is a is a genre breaking trope to have cats and dogs like each other um but yeah, yeah i realized I, years ago i was i was interviewed for a, a kids um kids radio show thing and it was a kid doing the interview and i had a bad guy dinosaur in blastosaurus uh and he was a velociraptor obviously because i'm not that good at, i don't know they're anything terrible about you know i know I, like i know three types of dinosaurs i don't i don't like dinosaurs <laughs> um i just I'm, I'm like dinosaurs in space like they're the two things that i cannot get behind um and anyway so i had a velociraptor in there he was a bad guy and this kid interviews me he goes Hey, did you make the did you make the uh, bad dinosaur red because your good dinosaur is green? So it was like a traffic light. Like, oh, that's how I have to be thinking. No, I didn't. I didn't think about that at all. I, I didn't even do the coloring on that issue. Um, all right, fair enough. Yep, you're right. There is a good and bad traffic light. <laughs> that's, but that's that is the joy of the whole thing, though. You set it out into the world, and people see in it what they want to see in it. Of course, I'm the age where. I'm from the generation where half of the dinosaurs I was taught about as a child yeah. never happened, didn't exist. When they have feathers now. Well, but like the Brontosaurus, which yeah. was like a staple dinosaur, not a real thing. It's the head of one dinosaur on the body of a plesiosaur with the legs from something else. Like they got I, it I, all. They got it all I thought wrong. They somehow, I thought they somehow brought the brontosaurus back. I don't know if it was reclassified or something. It's <laughs> just a please. Maybe they called the plesiosaur the brontosaurus now, well, but I remember the moment where they said, oh, and pterodactyls, that was the head from one thing stuck on the body of another thing. Now those are pterosaurs, and then there's a second. It's all it's all chaos. Pterodons, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it. Um, yeah, I, it's kind of like a Pluto thing, I think. Yeah. You know how they keep, yeah. like, like, Pluto is a planet one day and then not. Yeah. Uh, and then, then there's public outrage, so it becomes a planet again, but then it's not. Um, I was, I, I, and I'm like, what about Stellar Pluto? No. He's out of the team. Yes. No more. I also think it's funny, Richard, that you don't you don't like dinosaurs and you don't like space, but I you're just, a big you're a big Ninja Turtles fan, and issue four or five is dinosaurs in space. Yeah, but David, <laughs> I read I read my first Ninja Turtles comics. When I was twenty five, ah, like, like I, I was, I was young enough um, that that like the TV show started when I was four, mm -hmm. 
And uh, like we didn't have comic stores in New Zealand. Like there are four comic stores in the entire country. Wow, really? <laughs> I didn't wild. read. I didn't read an actual comic book until I was 16 years old, by which time I'd already published 35 of them. <laughs> like, I, as a kid, the reason I started making comics was because I thought these don't exist anymore. If I'm the only person in the universe making them, I'll probably be a millionaire by the time I'm 10. <laughs> Were, were you in a? I I know the scale is a little different, but were you in a big town, a big city in New Zealand, or were you in a yeah. small town? No, I was in, like I was in Auckland, which is technically sure. the biggest city in in the country. Right. It's a one and a half million people. Um, but like there was a comic store there, but for me to get to it, it would have been a two hour bus ride. Wow! Like it was, you know, I I, I went to a comics. I I actually. I wandered into my first comic convention by accident because I was in the city looking for a comic store because I couldn't find any in the yellow pages. Wow. And I you found a, a connection. You found a convention by accident. Yeah. I did. And I, I've, I, I'm, I'm very proud of this. I've never paid money to get into a convention because that first convention, they were unloading uh, – Craft craft dinners were trying to like get mac and cheese to take off in New Zealand. It did not work, um, and they were unloading a truck full of mac and cheese. And they saw me walking past, and they said, "You look like you like food," which I think is the best compliment. Amazing. <laughs> if you help us carry this, we'll give you some. And I said, "Can I just go in there for free if I take a box of them?" And they're like, "Yeah, sure." And I, I wandered in, and I like bought. I I I, I locked in. I managed to buy every issue of Miracle Man for fifteen dollars. Nice. Oh, 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 yeah. Marvel Man in, in, in America. Sorry, right. Marvel Man. I love the, the Miracle Man one. Um, and like, I was like, "Oh, comics are cool." I guess these do exist. I mean, I kind of knew they existed by then, but still. And yeah, <laughs> it's funny though to, to start with yeah. Miracle Man, Marvel Man, which is of course a deconstruction of other comic books. Uh, which you were not reading, <laughs> you know. I will, like I will say this: like I, I, I that weekend, I because I went back the next day. <laughs> by that point, I had a staff T-shirt for the convention because I like to steal things, and <laughs> I wandered in for free again. And I, I picked up. Um, I was like, I like this Ellen Moore fellow. I've never heard of him, so I picked up uh, Watchmen and From Hell. And that week, my English teacher caught me reading Miracle Man in class, and it was the birth issue, which is not a great thing oh, for your teacher. Boy. And I was like, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I don't know. I, I got nothing. The next day I'm reading From Hell, and it's the bathtub handjob scene that that same teacher catches me reading, picks it up, and said, right, I'm going to read this aloud to the class for you, Richard. And he starts reading. My teacher's name was Mr. Perkins, and this was the scene where the woman giving the hand job refers to the penis as the Mr. Perkins. Oh, wow. We, we, I did not do well in that class. <laughs> wow. It's a god shot. That's yeah. Amazing. For those who don't, who haven't read Marvel Man, Miracle Man, uh, the birth issue is a fairly groundbreaking thing that shows an actual human birth in a comic book. You know, yep. in great graphic detail, yep. uh, which is also kind of shows the power Alan Moore had uh, in the mid '80s that he was able to say, "I'm going to do is I'm going to do a birth scene in a superhero comic." And that was that's never ninth, been done. That was the ninth issue, so it was the yep. ninth comic I'd ever read in my entire life, and I was like, "I guess this is what comics are." I think nice. I think unrealistic expectations were set. Uh, yeah. yeah. Any, imagine if you'd be like, I'm just reading some Batman as a kid, issue nine. Oh, Batman gives birth. Cool. Like, <laughs> yeah. that changes you. You can't go back. Now that I want to see Batman give birth, actually. Yeah. In the comic book. I think that would I was going to say, it, yeah, it explains yeah. all the poop, I think. Yeah. <laughs> One interesting thing, um, and this is with the kids and the adults type thing, is if you work on My Little Pony, there's a huge adult following of My Little Pony. Um, so you have this really interesting contest of uh, something that's made for little girls mm -hmm. and has a huge convention size following of 
bronies and men, adult yeah. men, you know, so much that there's been okay, bronies made of them. And mm. you've gone to conventions, you know, and mm. not a kid to be seen. No. But the stories are some still of all them, for kids. Some, no, the one in Germany had no kids, but some of the ones in the States that I've yeah. been to, they okay. have kids. Like they'll have kids' activities, uh, sessions and stuff that I'd like show them how to draw a pony sort of thing. So yeah, there's kids in some of them. The one in Germany didn't have kids. <laughs> that was amazing. So <laughs> she gets invited to Germany for a brony con. I said, I have to go to this 100%. <laughs> there's no way I'm not going to not be here for this. Yeah, I mean, it's my first time to Europe. I didn't want to go alone either. <laughs> so, <laughs> German, I, don't, I don't think you should have been alone at a My Little Pony con in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just, that's the, that's the opening scene of a horror movie. Uh, I I myself don't want to watch. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's 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 kind of like Bone meets From Hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If you're not gonna use that, <laughs> brought it brought it brought it all all the way home. Uh, it's a yeah. great moment where Brenda was being introduced on stage as one of the guests, and it was a room of about two thousand mm -hmm. grown adults and their stuffed ponies. Mm -hmm. And she walked out on stage after being introduced. It was like a rock concert. It was like Kiss. It's just, <laughs> you know, God, the God, God bless the enthusiasts. They, you know, they 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 pay our rent sometimes. But it is, yeah. it is. There are there are fandoms where I'm just like, okay, I don't, you know, <laughs> you you do you, man. I am I'm not. I'm I'm sure there's something I love that's as absurd as that. Um, I'm sure there are many, many things I love. Stuff, so like, can, like, honestly, can we just let kids have their stuff that they like and not try and make it gross an adult? Like, <laughs> is, like, I work really hard to do like a lot of cool kid stuff and a lot of cool adult stuff, and they're for different audiences. And when like I get sent emails from someone who's like, "Hey, I wrote you this sexy Blessedora story," I'm like, "Why though? <laughs> you, just, just not, you could have like any time that you can make that decision, you could instead just decide to go and buy yourself some ice cream. Like that's all. <laughs> that's a better option than writing the words, "I'm not a Tricera bottom." Like, don't <laughs> wow. That's I a good joke, know. though. That is a solid. That is That's a, a solid joke. joke. But I mean, <laughs> sure. But like, don't put it in Blastosaurus. You're not putting it in Blastosaurus. I guess that's the point. But don't, don't just don't don't be. I mean, look. You can like my little My Little Pony at any age. You don't need to make it sexy. Yeah. Don't. And I'm, yet, I'm sorry, I'm that, the alien you know, that stuff is such a big draw. Uh, you know, I think one of the great one of the great moments in an adult's life is when they realize, you know, this isn't for me. I don't. It's okay. It's okay that I have moved on from this. This doesn't. This doesn't have to be for me anymore. The what? What? One of the fan things I just completely reject is the whole "you ruined my childhood" yeah. narrative. It's, it's like, man, Steven's no, like, been making bad Indiana Jones movies since 1985. Where have you been? Like, this is not... Unless, unless the writer of that thing is, like, also your parents, they didn't ruin your childhood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I hated the last Bond movie. I'm a huge James Bond fan since my childhood. And when we walked out of Spectre, I turned to my wife and I said, they can stop. It's good. They, they don't... They don't, you know, they want to. I'm the world's biggest Bond fan. I'm like, you know, they can stop making these movies. I'm good, but yeah. I'm not like. I always like. I always. Used, I, I always used to say, you know, to my wife's great disappointment, Chris Pine has not shown up at my house to throw my William Shatner DVDs in the fire. Like, there's no. It, it's still there. I I can I can watch them whenever I want. We're good. And you know, there's no. What you didn't do what you absolutely did not do after seeing Spectre is get mad about it. Yeah. You were just like, oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So okay. this is now the, this series is now in the hands of really terrible writers and directors. And you know, that'll, that'll happen sometimes moving on. Like, when, <laughs> you know? when, they, when they rewrote the Smurfs to include Nanny and Sasset, I was mad about it. Cause I was nine. Right. And it made it inconsistent. Right. When they made a Gargamel figure the same size as the Smurfs. I was mad about it. Because I was nine and already too <laughs> old for Smurfs. But that's the, you know, I feel that way about all all long-running 
franchises. You dip in and out of them when you like. I used to say towards the end when when Deep Space Nine and Next Generation were on the air and I was watching them intermittently, I was like, this is sort of like reading your hometown newspaper after you've left. It's like, oh, we're at war with the Klingons again. How about that? You know, like, oh, Worf got married. You know, like, I don't, I don't really care, you know, but I'm just like, I'm checking in all oh, the Kardashians. Something's going on with the Kardashians. Oh, that's nice. You know, <laughs> but, it, but, to, but to be like completely, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's just a gene that I'm missing, but that, that whole, like, it's like the, you know, the last Star Wars trilogy. Are they the three greatest movies ever made in the history of mankind? No. But also I was not 12, 15, and 18 when they came out. Mm-hmm. And I will never be 12 years old again when a Star Wars movie comes out. That is a physically impossible thing. Uh, like, and that's, I'm not going to blame J.J. Abrams for me not being 12. <laughs> if your Facebook comment about The Simpsons is complaining that it's not as good as one you saw... 30 years ago, rethink your life. Right. <laughs> like, think right. about every single thing you have done leading up. Like, I want everyone to stop and be like, hey, what if Clarence from It's a Wonderful Life showed me what my, what the world would be like without me? Ah, oh, it's better. Shit. Just <laughs> stop. <laughs> I, think we will, uh, I think we will end on that, uh, that note. <laughs> Amen. Um, we're starting to wind down here anyway. Absolutely. Uh, Guys, why don't we uh, why don't we go ahead and check out? Um, we'll we'll go around the uh, you know around the uh, the picture here and tell us uh, you know what you're up to, where we can find you, uh, uh, you know, sell us your wares, all that stuff. Um, Richard, why don't we start with you? Uh, I'm Richard Fairgray. Um, it's as it sounds, uh, a y not e y. I am the writer and artist on Black Sand Beach and Blastosaurus. RichardFairgray.com. I'm on Instagram as at Richard Fairgray author, and I'm at Richard Fairgray everywhere else. Um, my book, Black Sand Beach, is is out everywhere now. It's a 200 page graphic novel. It's super good. Volume two comes out next year, and I'm working on volume three right now. The ebook comes out October 6th, and there's a free sample of my of the first three short stories from my short horror fiction collection, and my podcast, Tales from Black Sand Beach. The first season is all online everywhere you get podcasts. Great. And this right. is Taku. He really wants to be seen here. <laughs> yeah. So Aww. Yeah. Gets. yeah, he's our mascot. He's hungry. He wants his bedtime snack, so he's <laughs> on here if you're yeah. screaming outside. Yeah, sorry about all the cat meowing. <laughs> yeah, he's in agony. It's, yeah. it's a feature, not a bug. So, Brenda, what are you working on? Um, I am Brenda Hickey. I work on, well... I work on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Laddie W. Egrets go with Oni Press and do some creator own stuff. We, we're Pegamoose we have Press. Pegamoose Press together, yeah, which we, we publish, self publish our own books at. So, Halls of the Turnip King and Angor Napkin so yeah. far, and building on that. So, that's, and then you. Yeah, we're we're trying to really push the uh, the Kickstarter worked really well for us having two books go through there, both successful. Mm-hmm. We made some nice hard, hardcover books. And our next book we're going to do is actually going to be a collaboration that we both mm-hmm. wrote and illustrated together, mm-hmm. like half and half the book, and it kind of bleeds over in a weird David Lynchy kind of way. And it's a haunted house story, so we can do a little bit of spooky, little bit without of spooky. being without being too uh, too creepy, but just yeah, spooky. kind of all ages. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's going to be coming out uh, next year, uh, mm-hmm. probably May. We'll, something like that next year we'll run a yeah, kickstarter we'll for that see. and yeah. hopefully there'll be conventions and all this mm. stuff we get to see you guys and sell all these books we're making yeah uh, right that I, would be nice yeah <laughs> i guess we should say where we are on the internet i oh, yeah. mostly use instagram i'm just brenda under slash e under slash hickey on instagram and then we also have the pegamus press instagram yeah pegamuspress.com is our website mm-hmm. um yeah google troy little you'll know, find us on there mm-hmm. <laughs> nice where you at, Avalone? And, and Troy Little also has upcoming soon the uh, Radically Rearranged Ronan Ragdoll's 40-page special. Um, we owe that to our Kickstarter supporters, but that will be, as soon as they get it in their hands, we'll probably be soliciting it for comic book shops. Um, finishing up Drawing Blood Volume 2, which also will go to Kickstarter people, but will then... Uh, Probably that'll be 
graphic novel early next year. And by, and I do mean graphic. We won't be doing floppies on it. It will just be coming out as a trade paperback. And I can be found at davidavalonefreelance.com. Uh, and that has the links to all of the things. I, I have to say, Avaloni, I've enjoyed the uh, sort of evolution of uh, of your picture. Um, yeah. You know, our uh, our podcast listeners, uh, you know, on on, on Apple or whatever, uh, will be deprived of this. But if you're watching on YouTube, uh, Avaloni started out uh, uh, very interestingly lit by uh, by the, by the, the setting, sort of setting sun. sun coming through yep. the. And, and, and over the course, uh, you know, there's just been this uh, this this, now, this corner. This corner of the apartment has a red light that goes on automatically. Yeah, at, you uh, look like you're in, in, in a club in Goodfellas or something like that. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I thought about supplementing it, and I went, no, I this is a good look for me. Yeah, I think maybe I need to get like a blue light, and then yeah, we can there just you go. next time do this. But um, yeah, uh, uh, you know, without drawing it on for too long, I am uh, Rylan Grant. Uh, I can be found uh, everywhere uh, on all social media platforms at Ryland Grant. It's R-Y-L-E-N-D-G-R-A-N-T. I always spell it because it's not a real name. My parents made it up uh, probably while in heavily intoxicated. So uh, I feel the need to, uh, to make clarifications. Uh, my books, the, uh, the Ringo Award winning uh, uh, Aberrant and uh, the recently Ringo nominated uh, uh, Banjax are available uh, and find comic shops everywhere and uh, uh, via Comixology and Amazon and the whole nine yards. Um, my recently kickstarted uh, uh, book, The Jump, uh, is still available. Uh, if you missed the Kickstarter, it's at uh, the jump, all one word, dot backer kit, dot com. Uh, check in there for uh, plenty of uh, uh, goodies. Um, if you are watching on one of our many uh, uh, YouTube channels, uh, make sure to smash the like button. Uh, make sure to subscribe. Make sure to uh, tell your friends. If you are listening to us on uh, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, uh, wherever uh, one gets uh, his or her ear crack, uh, again, subscribe. Leave us a five star review. Uh, grab your friend's phone. Uh, subscribe for him or her, and all that noise. Uh, we will be back next week with uh, with more fun, more debauchery, uh, more uh, enlightening conversation. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, it was a uh, it was a hell of a uh, discussion here. Thank you, Troy. Um, Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Oh I'm so sorry I talked about poop that much. I, <laughs> I love it. Guys, for that. Hmm. Yes. Okay. There's definitely an audience for that, and this is that audience, I'm pretty sure. Thank you for poop. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. See you next week. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. Bye.